Um, we're going to be studying the miracles of Jesus in um, the book of Acts, not the miracles, miracles by God in the book of Acts. And we'll see um, where we go uh, with it. And, and what we're going to see is that there, there's, there's, a, there's an emphasis, a, a movement on, on the Holy Spirit, right? Um, as a matter of fact, the, the, the name of, of the book of Acts is, is the Acts of the Apostles, but some people call it the Acts of the Apostles through the Holy Spirit, right? And so uh, we'll see power in the Holy Spirit and we'll be spending time learning about the Holy Spirit. And speaking of which, um, I want to uh, remind you that February the 5th and the 6th, um, which I think is like already, what, in two weeks, um, I believe, uh, we'll be having a, a special guest speaker, uh, Keith Miller. And um, he'll be, he teaches a lot over the, the Holy Spirit and over the supernatural healing and, and prophecy and those type of things. And so I hope that you guys uh, make the time to come. And don't just come. Uh, in these next two weeks, be praying. Who, who will I take with me? Um, to, uh, to that service, and I hope that you guys make that time to come in February 5th and February the 6th. Six here at Pueblo's Church, but he'll also be here Wednesday night, and you're more than welcome uh, to join us Wednesday night as well. Let's go ahead and read Acts chapter 3, verse 1. And it says, And Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Now this means that he was, he was a cripple, he wasn't able to walk, not lame like your pastor's jokes. That was a joke right there. Totally missed it. It's a tough crowd this evening. Each day, <laughs> each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate. So in the temple there was a gate and the gate's name was beautiful. Right? So you imagine if the gate was beautiful, how beautiful then was the temple itself. Uh, let, let us continue. It says, so he could beg from the people going into the temple, smart, when he saw P Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. And Peter and John looked at him intensely. And Peter said, look at us. And the lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. Let's read that one more time. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. And all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. And when they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. And they all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's um, colonnade, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Verse 1. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer services. I, um, I generally break up my notes, um, you know, just kind of like when we were in eighth grade and they taught you how to write a, an, uh, an essay and, you know, you have like Roman numeral one, a, B, and C, three points for A, B, and C, and then Roman numeral two, right? And then A, B, and C, and three points for A, B, and C, and Roman numeral three, and four, and five, and so on, right? So one was your intro, and, and five is your conclusion. And, and basically, whenever I, I prep my message, um, in all honesty, I, I usually just have a, a five-point um, you know, uh, outline, starting with Roman numeral one, and sometimes I'll even write intro, right? Because, you know, I've got to remind myself. And sometimes I'll write at number five, end it, right? Because if not, I'm a preacher. I'll preach another five hours. Not one amen. I thought that someone here would be like, amen, pastor, about time we go back to those days, right? But nobody ever was like, no, i got to work. And all right. They, they, amen to that. We got to work tomorrow. Okay. All right. All right. So I'll, I'll keep it short. Anyways, um, kind of like my dog's tail. No, I'm just kidding. And there's another lame joke right there. Brum, brum, psh. <laughs> it won't be long now. It won't be long now. That's, that's what the, the man said when they cut his dog's tail. It won't be long now. It won't be. <laughs> well, what, what 
what I do with my water? I feel like my throat's getting a little dry up here. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, uh, so what, what I put on my point here is I put pray, pray, pray. Pray, pray, pray. And the reason that I put pray three times is because the tradition there at the temple was that there were three hours of prayer. Uh, one was at 9 a.m., the other was at 3 p.m., and then the last one was at sunset. And here, Peter and John, they show up to, to the 3 p.m. one. You know, they didn't wake up too early, and then, you know, they want to be home early. And so they went to the 3 p.m. service. But, but, but the point uh, of it is that they, they prayed. Now, I want to tell you that, that many of us, you know, you read the scriptures and you hear a teaching and you hear about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost and you hear about Holy Ghost power. That's what we used to talk about back in the 80s. And, and, and we have Holy Ghost power and, and we want to be, be used in the supernatural. We want to be able to be able to, to prophesy or to speak in tongues or to pray for the sick and for them to heal. Or we want to be able to uh, interpret tongues or, or to be able to interpret dreams or visions. We want to operate with the promise that God has given us the promise of the Holy Spirit, but you cannot operate with the promise, the power that is the Holy Spirit, the person, the Holy Spirit, if we are not in prayer. Amen. If we're not in prayer, you cannot tap into that source. Amen. Prayer and worship is the gateway. It is the door that we would be able to, to operate in the supernatural, to be able to operate in spiritual matters. I deal with a lot of people and, and oftentimes, you know, there, there are people that, that they'll, they'll say straight out, say, you know, they, they consider themselves like, like spiritual supermen, spiritual superwomen. Well, let me tell you that if you consider yourself a spiritual superman, a spiritual superwoman, but you are not in prayer, then you're not very spiritual. A spiritual person is a person who is in prayer. Right. It goes hand in hand. You, you, you cannot be someone who is not in prayer and then claim to be a spiritual person. I remember a couple of years ago, I didn't share this last night, but I'll share it with you guys. I was on a plane and um, uh, kind of like across the aisle, I like to sit on the aisle, and across the aisle, but one seat behind me um, was this, um, this guy was sitting there and then this girl came and sat next to him and they were talking, they were talking out loud and they're just like right there, like where my ear picks up the whole conversation. I was watching a little novella there on the, you know, tablet. I just turned it off because I had one going, no, I'm just kidding, I wasn't watching anything, but uh, <laughs> that joke was a little bit better than the dog's tell, right? You know, just a little bit. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> and uh, somehow, you know, they were talking about, I, I think the guy said that he was an author and they started talking about this book and stuff. And then somehow, they started talking about uh, religious matters, religious situations, and then the guy said something that intrigued me. He said, he goes, you know, I'm not really religious. I'm, I'm, I consider myself more of a spiritual person. I often wonder, like, like what, what does that mean? Like, like what, what do you mean? You know, and, and, and that seems to be the phrase, right? People say that, like, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a spiritual. And, and we live in the South, but let me tell you that, that as, we, as all these Northerners move in and influence us more and more, right? That was a, that was a knock on all these people moving in. I'm sorry. Anyways, as, as, as we began to be influenced more and more by, by the secular uh, part of, of the United States and, the, and they begin to move in the South, you'll hear that more. Like, people claim to be spiritual, and I'm spiritual. I, I don't need to go to church. I, I consider myself spiritual. Well, you know, I'm not really a Christian. I'm not, I don't really believe in uh, organized religion because I'm sort of a spiritual person. Well, let me tell you that if you're not in prayer, you have nothing spiritual about you because spiritual people pray, spiritual Christians are constantly praying without ceasing. So I want to take a moment to invite you to live a life of prayer. Come a few minutes early to church and spend some time giving God thanks. In a few minutes, I'll pray for all of you. And, um, and, and as you pass through the prayer line, take a moment and spend some time here in front on your knees, praying, giving God thanks for, for, for the request that you are putting before him. You and I, even outside of this place, outside of these four walls, should be living a life of prayer. The Bible says that we should pray without ceasing. 
That means that we should constantly, continually be in prayer. Like, like our prayer should be continuous. You should think about God all day long. Touch with him. Connect with him. It, it's kind of like when, when, when a boy meets a girl and they start talking and then they, you know, he slides into her DM. I mean, you know, he gets her number and then, you know, they start talking. They start texting, right? And then what happens is that every, every day, every moment, they're like on the phone and, and, and your mom is asking, pues que tanto hablan, right? You know, like, you know, all the Spanish kids knew exactly what I was talking about, right? And so, you know, your mom is like, what do you talk so much on the phone? Like, eh, you know, and, and you're just on the phone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh -huh. Ooh, I have Netflix too. You do too? Wow, you see, we were meant to be. We have so much in common. <laughs> you like pizza? I like pizza too. Ooh, wow, man, we have so much in common. You breathe, I breathe too. Oh my goodness, like, we're meant to be. Do you take a shower every day? So do I. But girls, when he tells you he brushes his teeth every day, he'd be lying. But anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop, pause right there. Uh, a couple of years ago, I broke my ankle, and uh, I, uh, there's a, a couple of uh, guys here at church that they were going to our, um, they go to our school, or some were going to our school in those, those years, and um, we would all play uh, uh, pool, right, through text. What is that called? What was that game called? Eight ball. We all play eight ball. And so I knew exactly when these kids woke up, went to school, got out of school, and went to sleep. How? Because when they would wake up, they would, a pee, they would like, you know, they would send it my way, right? And then we would play all morning, and then when they would stop, I knew they were in school, they took up their phones, right? And then when about three o'clock, bing, they would text me, and we would start playing again because they were out of school, right? And then we would play throughout the entire day, we're just going back and forth, you know, it was a game like where you're texting, right? You know, the, the moves. And then at, at evening, you know, maybe like one, two in the morning, I would stop getting moves back, you know, like, and so I'm like, ah, oh, they, they, they fell asleep, right? Or I would stop sending back, so they probably like, oh, Pastor Ruben went to sleep already, right? And so, you know, those, those uh, three, two, three months where I was just stuck at home, you know, I, I knew the schedule of, of, of all the kids that were on my basketball team because we would play um, eight ball. You check in with the Lord that often? Are, are, are you checking in with, with God that I'm, I mean, we, we should be a people that we desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, I often say that the ultimate prize, the main thing about coming to church is that we want to be in the presence of God. And for us to be able to grab on to the ultimate prize, to be able to tap into the ultimate prize, uh, we must be a people of prayer. As a matter of fact, one of the names for the temple was a house of prayer. Our church should be a house of prayer. It's very often, it happens very common that people will come, and they usually will come after church. They don't even bother coming to a whole service, but it's okay, I'm not mad. But they'll come after service, and they will say, like, Pastor, can you pray for me? Uh, you know, my wife is about to leave me. Pastor, can you pray for me? My kids are sick. Pastor, can you pray for me? I haven't been able to find a job. Pastor, can you pray for me? I'm struggling with this addiction or what have you. They, under, they don't even come to church, and they understand that this is a house of prayer, and there's someone that can pray for them. Well, we who make up the church need to be reminded every once in a while that this is a house of prayer and you and I need to be men and women of prayer. We need to pray, pray, pray. Can I get a witness on that? Someone should say praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Verse four says, Peter and John looked at him intensely and Peter said, look at us. And the lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. Actually, um, in the original, it says that he was expecting something, anything. But Peter said, I don't have anything to give you. I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. What do you have to give? What do you have to give? I want you to ponder this over the next few seconds, couple of minutes. Like, like what do I have to offer? Let me, let me tell you that, that all of us here have something to give. We all have something to offer. As a servant of Jesus Christ, as a child of God, as an ambassador of the kingdom of God, we all have something to offer, something to give. If you are married, you're, you're a married man, you, you have a ministry in your household. 
If you are married and you're a married woman, you have a ministry in your household. If you are parents, you have a ministry over your family. If you're a neighbor, you have a ministry in your neighborhood. If you work, you have a ministry. And that means that wherever you're at, these are opportunities for us to serve in a way that is going to honor God. And ask, like, what do you have to give? Now, I like that it says that Peter and John looked at him intently. Like they, they saw him, they noticed him, they did not ignore him. They saw and noticed that he had a need and they did not, did not ignore his need. Many of us, you know, we spend so much time in church that we begin to ignore the needs around us. This is a, this is a fact about church. I'm not talking about Pueblo's church, not us. I'm talking about every other, no, I'm just kidding. I'm talking about all the churches, all right? You know, like that. This is a problem in the church, especially here in the United States. I mean, come on, we live in the most prosperous country of the world. We live in the most prosperous state in the most prosperous country of the world. And we live in perhaps the most prosperous city of the most prosperous state of the most prosperous country in the world. And oftentimes we can be blind to the needs that are happening around us. Reminds me of the story of the Good Samaritan where, where Jesus speaks about this, uh, this man that was robbed and beaten and left for dead. And then he says that the priests and the Levites, these were the religious, these were the church people, passed by and ignored him. But we don't see this in Peter and John. Peter and John saw someone in need and they looked at him intently. They looked at him intently. I'm a part of a group of pastors here in Pasadena and we meet together and um, <clears throat> the main reason that we meet is to uh, uh, talk and we've worked on several projects on how our churches can serve our community. You know, and so uh, we did like at the beginning of the school year, uh, we were one of the churches that participated in the field of bus, right? And so we got a lot of school supplies, helped some of the kids. Um, <clears throat> at your school, Pueblo's Royal Christian School, um, our high school class and a couple of uh, adults go to a nearby elementary and they mentor some elementary kids. And so we participate in a few programs like that. But every once in a while, I'll tell the pastors, I'm like, hey, I, I know I don't need to say this because we're all pastors, but I feel like I need to say this. Let us not forget that the best way we can help our community is to get people in the church. It's to get people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can tell me the great needs in our community. You can say, well, well perhaps the greatest need, and, and, uh, and uh, a, uh, one of the superintendents of, of PISD told us the greatest need in our schools is poverty. Well, the solution to poverty is the richness of our Heavenly Father, and the greatest gift that our Heavenly Father has given us is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the solution. And you may say, well, well, my biggest problem is, is that, that I'm sick. Let me tell you, you need Jesus. My biggest problem is that my, my husband, he's always mad at me, or my wife, we just don't get along, our family is falling apart. You need Jesus. Jesus is the solution to it all. Jesus is what will get you through the storm. That's why God didn't send Google or WebMD or whatever. What did God send? God sent his son. Because Jesus, remember the Christmas story? And you shall call his name Jesus because he shall what? Save. Jesus saves. And so the, the greatest uh, 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 need uh, needs Jesus. The solution to the greatest needs is Jesus. Now I like that this guy, he looked at Peter and John and he looked at Peter and John expecting something. There are people that are in need and they kind of expect the church to do something. But let's be honest, is that throughout the years, we have disappointed. We are so caught up in our church that we forget that we must live out our faith outside of these four walls. Okay. I was in a meeting with um, the people that help out in parking lot, um, uh, and some of the services, ushers, and stuff like that. And I was telling them, sometimes like I'll invite people, I'll be like, hey, why don't you help out? Like, we need, we need help in the parking lot team. And they'll be like, nah, um, I don't want to get cold. 
They don't mean like cold because it's cold outside. They mean spiritually, you know, like I'm not going to be in service. I don't want to get cold. I'm like, brother, you're already cold. I mean, if you, you don't get it, you don't understand that to live out our faith is to serve people. You're already cold. You don't get it. And we have to understand that it's not just about coming and, and receiving uh, the, the, the message, the preaching. We sang some songs. I'm going to give my offering at the end. All of that we should be doing. But this, this here is, is sort of like we're batteries. You and I, we're batteries. And when we come to service, we got connected to the charger and we recharge. And then we went out to live out our faith. But this world is so hard and harsh on us that when we truly live out our faith, we began to lose that charge, lose that energy. So therefore, we come back to church to recharge. But the point is that you go out and live the faith. Let me tell you that if you're fully charged, you leave church tonight, oh man, loved it. That's what I needed. But then you're fully charged Sunday, and you're also fully charged next week, and you're also fully charged the week after, something's wrong. We should be drained because we're living out our faith outside of these four walls. And so Peter and John, they're not in the church. They were outside of the church and they saw that there was a need and then they met the need. Now, I love, I told you earlier that it says that he was like uh, expecting some money. But in the original, it says that he was expecting something, something, anything. I'll, t I'll take anything. Always cracks me up. Um, there's a certain intersection and like uh, there's this guy who heals a sign that says like work for food. And this has happened to me and it's happened to friends of mine. Like we'll give them food. <laughs> like, I'm about to make Big Mac and I'll see someone, we'll work for food. I'm like, well, let me give them the Big Mac, right? You know, like that. And they'll look at it like, thanks. Like they will get mad because you actually give them food. And I'm like, I don't get it, but you know. There are some people that are in great need and, and, and we should use our best judgment and help, but we should always be willing to help. To, to lend a hand, like, like how can I help? Because here he is expecting something, but he, he's expecting money. And Peter and John disappoint him by saying, I have no silver, no gold. It's like today, you go and you ask someone, hey, can I borrow five bucks? What do most people say? Nah, oh, man, I don't, I don't carry no cash. We're getting close and close to where panhandlers are going to say, what's well, okay, man, you can cash up it to me, right? You know, like that, like, sorry. Right? We don't have cash. I don't have no silver. I don't have any gold on me. But what amazes me is that Peter and John, they say, we don't have any silver, we don't have any gold, but what we do have, we will give to you. And then they say, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, because let me tell you, Jesus was a common name. There's a lot of people named Jesus. But when they said Jesus of Nazareth, this guy understood, oh, Jesus, the one that was crucified. He says, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Get up, rise up. And the man, he, he regained strength in his feet, in his ankles, in his legs. And he got up and he jumped up and he stood up and he went with them into the temple, praising God. He received much more than he expected. He received much more than what he expected. It reminds me of the scripture where it says, so it is written, what eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, or what not has entered into the hearts of men are the things that God has for those who love him. Let me tell you that the same God that gave this lame man more than what he expected is the God that we come to worship tonight and he continues to give us more than what we expect. Some years ago, uh, my wife and I, we went to uh, go eat tacos and we had exited the freeway. It was late at night. I eat very late. It was in a not so safe neighborhood. And um, you know, one of those, uh, the panhandlers that they clean the windshields, he starts walking toward us with, with the, uh, what is it, the squeegee. And so I'm like, and he's like walking toward us and I'm like, 
And um, so he like puts it on my windshield and I roll down the window. I'm like, look, I have no, which I didn't. I'm like, I have no cash. I don't have no coins. I'm gonna feel really bad if you clean my windshield and I have nothing to give you. This was like the longest red light in the history of red lights. <laughs> it, just, it was like, if it turns green, I'll take off. <laughs> you know? and so he says, you know, all of us need a blessing every once in a while. And he cleaned my, he cleaned my windshield. I'm looking at my wife and we're like, you know, searching the car seat for that, you know, that $2 that sometimes falls under the seat that you can buy French fries with every once in a while. You know, like we're like searching for that, right? You know, like that, there's nothing, nothing. And so when he finishes, I roll down the window. I'm telling you, this is the longest light in the history of red lights. I roll down the window and I, I say, come here. And so he comes to, I guess he thought like, oh, okay, now they're going to give me something, right? And so I'm like, come here. And I ask him, I'm like, what's your name? He says, Jacob. I'm like, Jacob, let me see your hands. So he gives me his hands and I press the gas. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. I didn't do that, right? I just, just wanted to see if you're paying attention. You are, okay, praise the Lord. So I'm like, let me see your hands. And so I grab his hand. We're there. I'm telling you, there's the longest red light in the history of red lights. And so I grab his hand and I began to pray for him. And I began to bless him and his family and I began to call on the Lord Almighty in the name of Jesus to pour down his blessings upon him. And, and when I opened my eyes, this guy, Jacob, he's, he's just like bawling, like he's bawling. And all what he kept saying was like, man, I needed that. I need, he's like, I love you. I needed that, man. I needed that. That's all he kept saying. And then the light turned green and I took off. And um, he was expecting silver and gold. He was expecting a dollar, some change. I didn't have any of that. But I was willing to give him what I did have. Let me tell you what Peter and John had there at the gate, beautiful. What Pastor Reuben had there at the light after the exit on the way to buy some tacos. You have it as well. It is to be able to bless. It is to be able to uplift. It is to be able to pray in the name of Jesus. And when we pray in the name of Jesus, powerful things happen in the lives of the people around us. And I'm going to pause so we can praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 2, as they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. <laughs> now, I like how they're very specific because Luke, who's the author of Acts, he's basically saying like, hey, man, you know the corner of Pasadena Boulevard and um, Curtis? Yeah. Okay, there's a church right there. Yeah. Okay, well, you know where that sign is? Yeah. Okay, right there. That's basically what he's saying. He's telling the, the people, like, hey, you guys know where the temple is at? Yes. Okay, but you know that one gate called Beautiful? Oh, yeah, I know that gate. Okay, that's where this happened, right? He's showing the validity of this miracle. That's not something made up. He's telling you exactly where it's at because, and, and who it was. It was Peter and John. He didn't say two apostles, two servants. No, no. He's very specific on who it was and where it was so that we could understand that, oh, okay, this is a real story. And, and he talks about how he was placed there every day. So people that went to the temple, they knew this guy. They understood like, whoa, yeah, I remember that happened. Now, Here's this man, lame, from birth, a cripple, someone who cannot walk. And what's the name of the gate? Beautiful. So at the gate, beautiful, there's something not so beautiful. At the gate, beautiful, there's something not so beautiful. Then talk to people, invite them to church. Many of you have experienced what I'm about to say. To someone, let's go to church. I, I, I can't go to church. I can't go to church. Oh, yeah, you can. I'll pick you up. No, no, no. I mean, I can, you know. But, I mean, you can always Uber. No, 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 no. I, I can go to I just can't go to church. Why not? Well, you know, I mean, I'm just too bad, too horrible of a person. 
I, I can't go to church. I, I do. When, when, when I'll go to church, when, whenever I quit drinking, that, that's when I'll go to church. Or I, I'll go to church whenever I quit doing drugs. That's, that's when I'll start going to church. I, I'll go to church whenever I, I quit cursing or smoking. You know, you ask them, how long you been trying to stop smoking? Well, about 20 years. Man, you ain't done it in 20 years. Just come like that. It's okay. Like that. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to judge you. I remember some years ago, um, <laughs> there was a, a, a homeless lady that she was always around here. And she came into one of our services. And so uh, someone comes up to me and like, Pastor, she came in. I'm like, who? Like the homeless lady. I'm like, oh, okay. And so he, the person stays staring at me. And I'm like, what? And they're like, you're just going to leave them there? I'm like, yes. I mean, where do you want them? Well, I want them in church, right? That, that, that's what we wanted. You know, I, I, I want the drug addict in church. I, I, I want the prostitute in church. I want the alcoholic in church. I want the one that's struggling with their marriage in church. I want the one that's sick in church. Why? Because this is a house of prayer. And when the people pray, 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 the Holy Spirit comes and begins to work and manifest. And before you know it, there is liberation. There is freedom. Alcoholics are free. Druggies are free. Addictions are broken. And people who are sick are healed. Why? Because there's power in the name of Jesus and power in the gospel of Jesus. Jesus Christ. So there's the power of the gospel is to cause something ugly to become beautiful. And the power of the gospel can cause something not so beautiful to become beautiful. What a beautiful story that at the gate, beautiful, there was something not so beautiful. But the ending, as we read, is something beautiful, more beautiful than the gate itself called beautiful. I was listening to this pastor from Miami, um, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Rich Wilkerson. Um, he's a pastor that married um, Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. And so Kanye was in Florida and these are very last minute type things. It's like, let's do a concert. I think the church is called uh, The Vu, right? And it's a last minute type thing. So, of course, you know, let's start at six, ends up starting at eight, right? You know, because it's last minute and I mean, there's equipment and people and all this stuff. And then, uh, not, you know, uh, let's say, I don't know how big the church is, but let's say it sits 2,000 and, you know, there's probably like about 15,000 people want to show up. So a lot of people that wanted to come in couldn't come in. And amongst the people that couldn't come in were people that normally do come in. And amongst the many that were able to make it in were people that normally don't come to the service. And so Pastor Wilkerson was saying that there were people complaining and they, and they were complaining. They were like, man, I just don't think it's right that, that we weren't able to go in and we go every week and, and people that don't even come to church, they don't even go to any church, they were able to go in. And then they were complaining, they were like, and you know, and some of them that did win, it smelled like they were smoking weed. And then so Pastor Wilkerson says, isn't that what we want from our church? That people who normally don't come in are flocking to get in. And we want the druggie to come to receive salvation, that he would be free from drug addiction. Amen. So we have to understand that's not just like us come to church and, you know, and, and there's a problem, you know, I don't, you know, Pueblo's church, we're growing and there's a different service, but, you know, I look at some of our Spanish services and, uh, you know, 1015's packed out service and, uh, you know, we could have maybe 30, 20 years of coming to this ch church, you know, we just had our anniversary a couple of weeks ago and in the services I asked like, you know, who's been here for five years, who's been here for 10 years, who started coming, you know, 15 years ago, who started coming 20 years ago, who started, and then, you know, whenever it got to like, who started coming 35 or, or 30, um, uh, 39 years ago, and you know, there were people, so imagine coming to church for 39 years and you sit the same bench And then you show up and there's someone sitting on your bench in your spot. You know, sometimes people get a little irritated. They're just like, oh, right? It's like, like, no, we should be happy and excited when people who normally don't go to church came to church. Amen. 
Just thought I would let you know. Apparently, there's people in church that they didn't know that that's sort of the goal. <laughs> that that's the, that's sort of what we want. We want people who normally don't come to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ to come in and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, just trying to help some people out here. So apparently people don't know. People don't know what it's about. And, and if that means that I've got to sit in another seat, well then I'm cool. Or if that means that there wasn't even room for me, but I get to hold the door for people to come in who don't know Jesus yet, hey, I'm going to be happy to do it. And if that means that when I pulled up, my normal parking spot was gone, praise the Lord. That means that people are coming to the feet of Jesus. See, I just, I just thought I'd clar clarify that because, you know, some people they, they just don't understand what it's about. Something beautiful happens when people come and encounter people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who are willing to pray for people in need. Let me say that again. Something beautiful happens when people who don't know God encounter people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and are willing to pray for people's needs. Something beautiful happens when that happens. This is how salvation comes. And this is how people receive a new life. And this is how people receive abundant life. And this is how people receive eternal life. When you and I understand that we must spend time in prayer seeking to receive and be filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit and to seek to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we are brave enough to go and pray in the name of Jesus for things that people would think would be crazy to pray for. See, a safe prayer would have been, look at us, God bless you, my friend. But Peter and John didn't do a safe prayer. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They had seen Jesus die and be buried and three days later resurrect. And so they prayed a powerful prayer. They grabbed a man by the right hand and they told him, we don't have any silver. We don't have any gold. But what we do have, we'll give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up. And he got strength in his feet and his ankles. And he jumped up and entered into the temple with them. Praising the Lord. Mm. Let's read. Amen. No one's playing golf. So it's okay to clap. I'm just kidding. Verse 7. That was another lame joke right there. Some of y'all got it. Verse 7 says, Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. And he jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. And all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. And when they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Let's close our Bibles in the stand up. You know, I want to encourage you in these days, um, Sundays I'll be teaching over prayer and we're looking at the temple and teaching over prayer and um, using the temple, the tabernacle as a, as a guide to learn how to pray better. But one of the key components of prayer and praise and worship is that we would be a thankful people. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, enter through the gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise. Like for us to be able to, to enter into the presence of God, there's a password. And the password to be able to come into the presence of God is thank you. And we would be willing to say thank you, God. And when we find ourselves forgotten, God is good. And he's still doing something in the midst of all of that. God is good, therefore we give him thanks and we praise him.